Okay, I'll start with who I am. That is my Twitter handle. Please do follow me. That would be really cool if we could keep in contact with each other. We could follow each other's Twitter feeds. And my website is at debrahide.com. I write about why people believe in strange stuff, but I tend to be interested in the malignant, unpleasant things. I think I'll, I'll leave the gods and, and the kind things to everybody else. I'll do the trolls and the vampires and the fairies and all that kind of stuff. Um, and I'm editor of The Skeptic magazine in the UK. So if you've ever seen that, please do keep in touch with our website and keep up to date with us. I am going to run you through an extremely quick history of this region because it actually relates to the kind of story that we're going to tell. It first was mentioned on um, a map of uh, Claudius Ptolemy in the second century, so we know that there was something established here and there would have been a little bit of Roman civilization. It's um, it, it's a very key place on an east-west road across Europe and Asia and on the Baltic road coming down from the north where they would, uh, they would trade amber. So it's quite a key crossroads. Um, but it's had a very mixed background. There has been a lot of Slavic uh, uh, in, um, invasion and then later on different kinds of governments would come in. In the 10th century you had Bohemia, then you had the Kingdom of Poland, um, there was a big pagan kickback in the 1030s. So the idea that this was somehow slam dunk a Catholic country is, is absolutely not true. Uh, again, we went back to Bohemia, um, then there was a Polish nation, um, there was the, uh, oh, the Battle of Huntsfield between the Germans and the Polish, so uh, then it moved back on to a different government again. We have documents from the early 12th century that, does, that do mention that uh, it was a very, um, a very mixed kind of a place. There were Bohemians, there were Jews, there were Walloons and Germans, so it was a very cosmopolitan trading kind of center, as you would expect. The Mongols came very briefly in the 13th century and as a measure for security, uh, the, town was, the town was burnt to the ground. So although they didn't actually settle, they still did have an effect on the landscape. And finally, you come up again, bouncing between the Germans and the Poles and the Bohemians, um, and we have something that really caused a massive difference to the history of, West, of Eastern Europe, it was the influx of the Seljuk Turks. Uh, they were coming in in the 1440s, and the Kingdom of Hungary was pushing back. In 1518, you had the Protestant Reformation, and Ratzwaff itself adopted Protestantism very early, but from 1526 onwards, they were ruled by the Catholic Habsburgs. Now, during the second half of that century, Rudolf II was very liberal. Has anyone ever heard of him? Have you seen the portrait of the me kind of late medieval king, and his face is made of fruit? Yeah, so that's how most people know of him. And he was an extremely liberal, intellectual, and interested man. Some people think he made a failure of the politics of the situation, but he was certainly very interested in the occult, which, bear in mind, was the beginnings of science. Um, it's very difficult to disentangle alchemy from chemistry, but once you've been at it for a couple of years, you manage. Um, so he was interested in the occult, he was interested in art, he was interested in culture, and even though he himself was a Habsburg and a Catholic, he was quite happy for there to be independent Protestantism. Um, so that was stamped down on later by his successor, Matthias, and that's kind of the kind of time that we're talking about. Um, with our ghost in 1591. In 1610, the Habsburgs started to help with the Counter-Reformation. So that's the background to our story. We have Slavic immigration with a pagan religious underground. We have an area which has been under, uh, under attack by many, many different forces over the years. You can see this map of Europe here and the kind of dynamics that were going on. You have um, Mongols coming in from, uh, um, from Russia, but eventually Christian Orthodoxy is an influence. Uh, Seljuk Turks coming up from the bottom are an influence. You've got Roman Catholicism coming from the center of Europe. And you also have Protestantism. And it was a truly, this wasn't just about what people believed. It's not whether or not people literally believed that Jesus was present in the Eucharist. This was about proper political power and money. The Reformation was a, the creation of our era, the early modern era, and um, it was politically important and it made a day-to-day -day difference to people's lives. 
This is an interesting map. I, I actually found this in a book called The Clash of Civilizations, um, but it was created in 1990 by a guy called Wallace, and he was talking about the kind of fault line uh, down Eastern and Western Europe, and on one side you have Eastern Orthodoxy with its religious um, traditions and Islam, and on the other side you have Roman Catholic Europe. And you can see part of the problems with our modern political situation is that some of, you know, places like Ukraine and Belarus actually are divided in terms of um, their political affiliations, their culture, uh, and how they work. Now, the story I'm about to tell about the shoemaker of Silesia, there are a few sources. The one that I'm using is uh, an antidote to atheism. Henry Moore was alive in the 1500s, and he was what was called a rationalist theologian. He was using um, the philosophy that Descartes had just, uh, the kind of mechanistic approach to the universe, to try to justify the uh, belief in the immaterial. So he was trying to use new science. Big mistake, by the way. Uh, the Catholic Church doesn't do this very much anymore. They're far too long, old, long in the tooth, and they leave it to um, silly old sort of evangelistic uh, um, movements to try to prove God by science. Um, so he was a rationalist theologian, and he wrote a couple of stories, for which we do have other sources too, um, about a shoemaker who, on September 20th, 1590, 1591, in Bratslav, which was then called Breslau, because it was under German uh, rule, um, went to a far part of his house, he said, and slit his own throat. There's a picture of what he probably would have looked like. He probably would have been a bit younger than that, actually, because at the time of his death, his wife had just finished giving birth. She had been laid in for about 10 days. So uh, we're looking at somebody maybe in his 30s and 40s who's left a young and vulnerable family. He had an honest burial becoming one of his rank and reputation. So um, this was unusual because he was Roman Catholic. He should really have been isolated and given an ignominious burial because he committed suicide. But this was because his wife covered it up. His wife and her sisters didn't want this to be to get out and for it to be a scandal. They were, um, by all accounts, a prosperous and perfectly respectable family. So the blood had drained completely out of his wound. They hired an old woman to dress the corpse, and they brought a couple of people in to look, a couple of authoritative people, like the local priest, so that people could see everything seemed to be in order. And this man, who had died before his time, but they said that he died of an apoplexy or a stroke. Uh, so it was all very respectable, and he got all of the religious rights that he was due. It's interesting now, if somebody committed suicide, we would think that was terribly tragic, and we would commiserate with their family. Bear in mind that if you're being a strict Catholic, it's a sin, it's a mortal sin, because your life isn't your own to take. That varies from culture to culture, of course. In ancient Rome, you could do it as a matter of dignity or pride if you had lost face or you'd done something wrong. You should commit suicide. But in Catholicism, it was um, a dreadful sin. He shouldn't have been allowed a proper burial and burial in hallowed ground. So she was getting a ritual that he wasn't entitled to because he had killed himself. Um, they eventually confessed that he died a violent death in some irresistible frenzy or madness. But what happened first was that there were six weeks of rumour. There were six weeks of rumour that he had killed himself and that not everything was as it should be. Now that first bit is interesting to me because if you don't have any difficulty within your community, why would people make rumours about you having killed yourself? So it suggests there that there was a little bit of anti within the community. Uh, she went to the magistrates and said, this is scurrilous, this is dreadful rumour, there was nothing wrong with my husband, he died of an apoplexy. Um, at which people started to experience ghostly visits. They saw him at night, they saw him during the day, they would experience him as a ghost, as a restless ghost. And in that culture, that would be a matter of him not being able to pass over to the other side clearly. So eventually she confessed that yes, he died, but he had an irresistible fit of frenzy or madness. It was temporary insanity. Therefore, he wasn't fully culpable for what he'd done and was still entitled to his, uh, uh, to his dignified burial. But things carried on. Um, 
the widow and to the discredit of her husband and herself being also animated there too by some busybodies, uh, mere rumours and idle defamations of malevolent people. So his wife was fighting some kind of local propaganda war with her neighbours. A spectrum in the exact shape and habit of the deceased, not only at night but at midday, that's not too uncommon, um, and such stirs and tumults all over the town that they are hardly to be described. So this was getting worse and worse and worse. Now, the way that that manifested itself with his, all of his neighbours uh, were that those who were asleep had horrible visions, and this would affect people who had been working very hard during the day. Um, has anybody heard of sleep paralysis? Yeah. Um, if you were awake, it would pull, strike, or press you, and people ended up with little bruises and things like that. Um, and he, he would stand by the bedside, he would cast himself upon them and suffocate them. Uh, you, you can see the um, medieval spelling there, not only blue marks, but plain impressions of his fingers would be upon sundry parts of their bodies in the morning. So people were seeing him in the day, they were seeing him at night. Some people who'd been working very hard found themselves oppressed by him. He was causing physical bruises and he was also making noises. So, about a few months later, uh, about some eight months later, they decided they were going to exhume him. This had got ridiculous. And in fact, there had been so many problems that the widow had finally conceded and said, yes, okay, you can, you can uh, dig him up and you can have a look. And what they saw absolutely surprised and shocked them. Basically, his body was found entire and not at all putrid. The clothes he was buried in were a bit musty and unpleasant, but his body itself was okay. Um, and it had no smell about it, so why? They were thinking he should have decomposed. His joints were limber and flexible, um, unlike those, those that are alive, uh, his skin only flaccid. Um, and they found a magical mark, an excrescence, they called it, in the form of a rose. It was probably like a little mole or something uh, on his big toe. So this was very puzzling to them. They were wondering why he hadn't decomposed and why he had this secret mark on his toe. The body was displayed for six days and reinterred on the 25th. Yes? When he was uh, dug up, yeah. did he have the slip trap? He did, and the, the wound was gaping, but it was just red and dry. Yeah. Um, and he was, he was reinterred, but he was reinterred under the gallows because that was a traditional place to put an outlaw. They, the ghost didn't stop. It still carried on, even though it was buried under the gallows. So when they disinterred him yet again, they had a look at his heart, and they found that it was entire, and it just looked like it had been pulled out of a calf, which alarmed and surprised them. And um, so they thought, okay, finally, they've got to this point. They really do have to destroy the corpse. They have to destroy the ghost. And the way they did this was to quarter him. They cut off his limbs. Uh, they cut off his head. And they burnt him to ashes. They, they reduced him totally to ashes. And then they threw the ashes in the river. Throwing ashes in a river is a good thing to do because rivers are moving and um, you can't get any stagnation. Magically, the idea is quite often you get rid of things that are potentially potent and troublesome, and you put them in a tidal river so that it all gets moved away. That's interesting what they're saying, though, that so that none may misuse the ashes. They were worried that sorcerers would get hold of them and use them for magical purposes. Um, now, you can use them in spells. What people often did in areas around here, and especially towards the south, is if they suspected someone of being a vampire, they would reduce them to ashes, and they would drink the ashes with water in order to stop the vampire attacking them. <coughs> if you look on my website, I went to um, a place in Rhode Island in New England, and they carried out a very similar ritual in 1892 in Rhode Island. So uh, th this is a magical tradition that has come from, London, uh, from, um, uh, from Europe uh, that you can... Basically, what you can do is you can take the body of some potentially very powerful and malignant supernatural being and you can kind of you can put it within yourself and somehow you can repel it by that kind of I suppose by saying look we're all in the same club it's okay we're all the same body so you really shouldn't attack me and it's a very peculiar piece of thinking because I can't think of any other context in which it happens <laughs> uh, 
Um, Paul Barber, who wrote a very excellent book on vampires, made the point that such accounts are accurate as the data, inaccurate as to their interpretations. And I think, given that we've heard some really good psychology talks in this, uh, in this conference, we would probably agree. People, people aren't brilliant witnesses, and uh, certainly their expectations, their beliefs, their prior beliefs, informs what they see. So let's revisit the whole thing based really on what people saw instead of what they made of it. I think that this ghost account bears uh, many marks of a poltergeist, the fact that people actually were left with bruising, uh, with physical bruising. Um, he, he left finger and injury marks. There's also witchcraft. Now, witchcraft, no matter how orthodox your religion, no matter how orthodox your society, if you live in a pre-industrial society, then you're going to get cunning people who are able to help you with your bad luck or with your health or finding stolen goods, and they're going to use not completely kosher methods. This is a very important point to remember that people aren't purely one thing. They t that most beliefs are syncretic. They take strands of belief from the orthodox religious environment that they're in, and they simultaneously believe in perhaps folk solutions and things like that. Uh, the fact that he was found with a mark on his toe, they interpreted as a sign that he had been marked by the devil. Women who were, um, found themselves in witchcraft trials found very similar things. They would, they would look for the devil's mark. The devil would make a mark on them to prove that they were a witch. Sometimes it was an extra nipple with which to feed their familiar. Now, does anybody want to take a guess at the kind of the peak for witch trials in, um, in Europe? Possibly some of you know, but bear in mind, you know, you've got sort of the deep medieval period uh, when people were really agrarian and there wasn't that many, there wasn't such an intellectual life. It was confined to the monasteries. And do you think there were loads of witch trials then, 11th century, 12th century, 13th century, 14th century, hands up? 15th, 16th, 17th, yeah, very well-educated audience. A lot of people tend to think that it happened back when people were stupid, air quotes, um, except they weren't stupid, they were no more stupid than us. Uh, really, what you see with belief in witchcraft is pretty well endemic. Uh, it's everywhere. But... To have a witch trial, you actually need something else going on. You need a kind of top-down activity. And the early modern period in Europe, with the tensions between Catholicism and Protestantism, uh, provided that, and that's when the witch trials really took off. So that was a, th the fact that they found a witch mark was actually a very contemporary phenomenon for this man. There's the ghost, Revenant Dead Strand. Um, people are supposed to stay dead, and if they come back, it's because they have unfinished business. You often find what I call unnatural predators, that is to say, if you say a natural predator is a lion, a wolf, or something like that, an unnatural predator is any kind of supernatural variety of the same thing. And one of the key characteristics of these things is that they die, again, air quotes, before their time. So um, suicide, uh, death in childbirth, something like that. It's as though they have some business to finish and their business was interrupted prematurely and that there's been some law of the universe violated. Um, and yeah, appearing after death is, is not a good thing, clearly. It means unfinished business. There's also clearly with this, everybody here knows about sleep paralysis, right? We, all as, as skeptics, we all know that sleep paralysis um, comes to people who tend to be overtired, sleeping funny hours, they lie on their back, and they can have hallucinations, which are astonishingly real, and it's associated with a great feeling of fear. Um, the, the hallucinations and the experience is very culturally specific. So if you happen to believe that your neighbor is wandering around pinching people, then it's not surprising that people experience their sleep paralysis through the, uh, through the filter of the latest ghost story to be hitting the town. And for me as well, this is, this is often cited as a vampire case, and it seems to be at first sight to be odd because he doesn't 
um, suck any blood. But then many vampires don't suck blood. They kind of, uh, it's allegorical that they take someone's life force away from them. Most of the vampire folklore that we have is where people, the vampire attacks their immediate family. And um, vampire folklore comes from two things, really. It comes from epidemic death. That doesn't even have to be an epidemic with the same disease, but just a cluster of deaths and a misunderstanding of the processes of decomposition. Uh, and there, from that line that we saw earlier between Eastern Orthodox and Islamic Europe, and then Catholic Europe on the other side, we can see that you could have the same underlying pagan Slavic beliefs, which is where the vampire comes from, and they could be manifested slightly differently according to the religiosity on top of it. So the kind of, the, the piercing long fanged thing that literally drinks blood, you get accounts of that further south, say in Serbia, something like that. But, but here I think this, this sort of story is consistent with the revenant dead um, as expressed in those, those pagan uh, sort of vampire ideas. Vampires don't decompose. That's one of the key ways that you can tell. You go and look. But bear in mind, in this case, that this man had been buried over winter. Now, we know all about decomposition because we've all got smartphones. And if you need to look at it, you can find out. You can be an expert in 10 minutes. But people in ancient times, for very obvious reasons, didn't keep corpses around to study them. They were a source of contagion. So there are things which slow down decomposition, which we know about and we can Google in a moment. And when we look back at these cases, we, we can spot them, we can identify them, but they couldn't necessarily at the time. In winter, the ground gets very hard, for example. It's extremely difficult to dig a six-foot grave. So uh, quite often you will find that a vampire is identified having been buried over the winter, possibly, in effect, kept in an icebox. Um, the other thing that affects rates of decomposition are um, obesity, uh, exsanguination, and of course we know that the shoemaker of Celestia lost all of his blood because he cut his own throat so deeply. So this would slow down decomposition. People also don't necessarily appreciate what they're looking at when they see somebody who's decomposing perfectly well. Uh, he was bloated like a drum. Now, that happens, that's perfectly normal decomposition, but they might have taken it as him being healthy. Um, in fact, he was, he was full of gas. So he had to be killed a second time. That's what you get with vampire ritual. And in the East, the tradition, the religious tradition, is that if somebody's body survives, that they are holy in the Eastern Orthodox Church. Uh, I'm sorry, in the Eastern Orthodox Church, is that they are unholy because they have been influenced by pagan Slavic religious traditions where the earth is a mother and where, when you die, you go back to your mother. Now, if your mother spits you back out, you are possessed by something hideous. So in the East, you find that um, bodies failing to decompose is a very bad thing. In the West, it can be a sign of sainthood. Catholic Church has several people who have failed to decompose. They've, um, their bodies have turned to what's called adipocere, and it gives a kind of a fragrant smell, and then centuries later, you can still see them. So I think a lot of this vampire kind of folklore is extremely understandable, and it's manifesting in this particular legend. We do have specific Polish vampires. Uh, does anyone want to get, I, I can say Upier. What's the female pronunciation? Upierka. 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 Thank you very much. Lovely. So um, there, there is actually, there is a good strand of Polish vampire folklore, and that's what they're called. Uh, that was from work by um, Jan L. Pakowski, which if you're ever interested in vampire folklore, he's kind of, he's one of the major guys. He's a professor in Slavic languages. He wrote an essay called The Darkling, uh, and he's, you know, he's done some absolutely fabulous work on it. And it was, it was he who first identified that he thought the vampire was, belief was um, a syncretic belief from uh, pagan, from from Slavic paganism and with an overlaying uh, level of Roman Catholicism on the top of it. He identified it back to the sort of like the 9th, 10th century. So what the, the, the story that I draw from this is, apart from the fact that people see pretty well, they interpret pretty badly under some circumstances. I think that's worth noticing. The second thing is that by Hopefully, by putting in that historical background first, um, 
I was able to explain that people aren't one thing. We may think uh, that we're in Poland and that Poland is Catholic, uh, but this part of the world really didn't form itself into nation states until fairly recently. I mean, I, this is something I really have to explain to English people because by virtue of being on an island, we've been able to have reasonably coherent culture for a rather long time. But different strands of culture come through. Um, the Kingdom of Poland was operating with Germanic law for centuries, even though it was, it was Polish. It was uh, run by the Holy Roman Emperor. There were, there were Slavic folk beliefs coming up from the bottom. So our identities are extremely complicated. And the word, one word descriptions doesn't cover it. Saying Christian is almost meaningless because you've got so many different kinds of Christian, Christianity and you've got different places where it embeds itself. So um, identities are extremely complicated businesses. These people had a ritual to hand, that's interesting, because for people who were theoretically extremely orthodox in their religiosity, they knew exactly what to do. They dug him up, they knew that they had to look at his corpse. Um, when they found that he wasn't decomposed, they knew that something was wrong. When they reinterred the corpse, they didn't reinter it in sacred ground, they reinterred it under the gallows, which is where you put criminals. Um, and when finally that didn't work either, they took his body apart and burnt it to ashes and put it in a running river. They wouldn't put it in a stagnant river they would, or, or a lake or something, they would put it in a running river. Um, so they had a ritual to hand and it was a scapegoating ritual. Basically it was a way of taking all of the bad things that were happening. It's a focus for a community, and it's a way for a community to feel enabled. You see this an awful lot during, um, during times of epidemics or social upheaval, that people really need to feel that they can do something, that they can be powerful. Was it, what was the term you were using the other day, Conrad? It was something like, you see these things in terms of, in times of existential, Existential security, yes. So uh, something that's really noticing and uh, noticeable, and I pointed out to Leo the other day, is that there's nothing. Uh, there's, you know, it used to be thought that civilizations went through various stages of development, and that the old-fashioned ones that were a bit dumb and hadn't really evolved yet would do silly things like have witch hunts. We could have witch hunts tomorrow. And it depends on the environment that we're in. Um, Nigeria is going through a witch hunting phase at the moment because uh, there is, you know, there's a lot of money flowing in, but only some people have access to it. There's, it is Christian and Islamic. There are three tribes, so it's, you know, it's like a perfect cauldron, a perfect melting pot of a society which is likely to need scapegoats and um, also, by consequence, need rituals in order to regularly expunge the evil. So these people, despite being good Catholics, had a ritual to hand. It gave them a sense of agency and it let them know what to do with the scapegoat. The other thing that I think is worth remembering for us is that traditionally there wasn't as much travel as there is now. There was travel, people did travel, but for the most part if you were born in a community, you stayed in that community and if you couldn't stand somebody, you still had to live next door to them. You couldn't escape whispering campaigns, and you often see this with witch trials, that there has been simmering resentment or, um, or, or bitter feuds, sometimes for decades, leading up to this just manifestation. The, 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 the accusations of uh, witchcraft or of somebody being a vampire don't come out of nowhere. And we have a couple of indications in the story with the shoemaker of Silesia that there was something there were people who were prepared to defame him and cause trouble for his wife. Yeah, scapegoats and anxiety relieving rituals we've covered. So I hope that I have shown you uh, that it's well worth looking at historical stories, not just for the excellent horror value, um, if you like reading horror stories, but the fact that these things are a way of also learning about ourselves. I noticed, um, I was watching the, uh, all of the exorcism videos the day before last, and I don't know if you felt the same as I did, because I love all this stuff, I absolutely love it, it's wonderful, it fascinates me, and I wonder if I like to go into the history of it so much, because 
it's uh, a way of displacing the anxiety and the unpleasantness. I can look at this and it's, you know, it's happened hundreds of years ago, it doesn't really matter. Whereas looking at a contemporary manifestation of such a thing is really distressing because those women in, those, in that video are still alive now and they went through this uh, experience and it, it was extremely distressing for them. There are people still being burnt for witchcraft today. So we're not we're not fantastic and advanced in Europe this could happen to us again it's circumstantial rather than being the stage of development whatever that is of a civilization and um, I, I think that studying this st stuff hopefully helps us to see the warning signs if it's likely to happen with our own communities again thank you very much